to talk for eight hours, Lisa. Don't no. worry. <laughs> we're live. We're live. Hello. Is it half past seven? It's half past seven. And we are live on Google Hangouts. All right. So I think we're doing this right. Um, we're live and we are on the air. Hello, everybody. It's the 14th. 15th? 14th of May. It's the 14th of May. God, best host in the world. The 14th of May 2014. And um, this is the very first after dinner with the Critical Classroom Google Hangout. Um, Google Hangout on Air that we've ever done. I've been planning these thing, this for about uh, a couple of years, ever since Hangouts on Air came out. And here we are years later. So this broadcast is recording. Um, so as the Hangout is being uh, broadcast or streamed, it's being uh, streamed onto YouTube. So you can either watch it here on Hangouts or you can watch it via YouTube. You may already be on YouTube. I think there's about a minute or so delay in the, um, in the broadcast. So before we start, I'll just do some housekeeping. Um, at the end of the broadcast, I'll update the show notes. So if you click onto YouTube and you'll see the video and then there's the text underneath, so they are the show notes. Um, I'll update those Update those with um, any links that we might refer to. I'll get my pen and paper out first. Um, any links that we might um, or resources that we might talk about um, as we're yarning and then I'll put them in there so that you can find out more information. Uh, the second thing is is that you might be watching this broadcast live and there are zero viewers, so right now there is nobody watching live, but hello anyway. Um, or you might be watching this in six months or six years. So either way, hello from the past. Um, the third thing in terms of housekeeping that I wanted to say is that we will probably mention people who there's a good chance um, I don't, we haven't planned to, but there is a good chance that um, we may mention um, people who have passed away, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who have passed away. So I'm just putting that out there right at the start. And the final housekeeping thing uh, to get out of the way is that, one, this is our first Hangout, so we haven't done this before. We've done Hangouts before, but not live on air. And so... And it's also not our technology. We don't have backup generators. Um, so we apologise in advance for any technical issues that we may experience if we go off because suddenly the house, there's a blackout. We will no longer be here and you'll have to go and do something else for the evening. So if something like that happens, um, we apologise in advance. We can't control it. We don't control Google. We're not Channel 9 or Channel 7. We don't have backup generators and all that kind of stuff. So um, if anything does happen and we suddenly go off the air, what we'll do is we'll um, just write a post about it on the blog so you can just find out what happened and um, and we'll we'll write... We'll just write up what we were planning on talking about. So I think that's all of the housekeeping out of the way. Okay, so my name is Lisa Wadigo and I'm the writer at The Critical Classroom. Um, and I'm joined by Lisa Buxton, who is an Aboriginal Education Officer with the Catholic Education Office in Sydney. Hi, Lise. Hi. Hi, hi. Hi. <laughs> we're both here. And um, I think um, if we these are successful, I'd probably, I'll probably... Probably um, ask other people to join us over time, so to talk about a range of topics. But um, okay, so the first thing that we have to do is we have to do something that is um, now customary in Australia, uh, and I'd like to acknowledge country, but I'm going to do that firstly by screen sharing. I'm going to share my screen with you. Share screen. This one. Start screen share. So this is my screen. If you can read this, you are on Aboriginal land. So this is a, a um, this slide was used in an education context. Firstly, I think I'm pretty sure by Dr. Jean Phillips, um, probably in the early 2000s, who at the time was teaching at the Queensland University of Technology in Brisbane, and she was teaching within the Faculty of Education. And this was the very first slide that. Uh, Dr. Phillips would show for her pre-service teachers in the EDB 007 course. Later on, I, when I, I, forget, I can't remember exactly when I started teaching, but 
at um, QCA, but I used it at Queensland College of Art when I was teaching Indigenous art protocols and practices. Um, I started using the same the same um, the same slide with the attribution of course but what I think is you know I really wanted to show this one first and I'll probably show it every every time because I think that it's a really powerful statement when you see something like this you know that you're on sovereign land and you're reminded that Aboriginal people have not ceded sovereignty they have not ceded sovereignty of the continent so they think that's really important and I know that some of you might be watching from outside of the Australian continent but given that there are indigenous peoples all over the world there is a good chance that this statement is actually relevant to you. So to begin, I would like to acknowledge that I'm broadcasting from Turrbal and Yuggera country, um, also known as Brisbane. And Lisa, you're broadcasting from? I'm broadcasting from Gadigal, Wangal land um, of the Eora Nation here in Sydney. Excellent. All right, I'm just going to stop this screen share. Oh, there I am again. All right. Gives you a bit of a surprise when you suddenly see yourself on the telly. Okay. All right. So this week, Lisa and I are going to talk about the WIPSI conference, which is the World Indigenous Peoples Conference on Education. I've only been to the Melbourne conference, which was in 2009 or 2008, late 2008, 2009. But Lisa, you've been to a few, quite a few WIPSI conferences. What kinds of things? So we're heading to Hawaii on Saturday. We're both flying out on Saturday. Um, what kinds of things can we expect from the WIPSI conference next week in Hawaii? Well, I think WIPSI is unique in that, as far as I know, it's the only professional development opportunity for Indigenous people run by Indigenous people. Um, looking at the website, there's over 500 different <laughs> workshops from people in education, from little ones in early childhood right through to higher education. Um, and there'll be there are presenters from you know North America, from Alaska, um, from Aotearoa, from um, our hosts in uh, Native Hawaiians. Um, the Sami people from Norway have been um, attending for you know the last 12 years or so, I think. And then a large delegation from Australia, of course. Yeah, I think I'm going to. Um, I'm hoping. A lot of people in my social networks are actually going, so I'm going to be meeting a lot of people for the first time, which I'm excited about. So, yeah, a lot of people have been talking about it, so it sounds good. How long have you been going to Whipsy? Um, the first Whipsy I went to, um, I think I was I just finished being a student. Um, it was in 1993, the year of Indigenous Peoples, and it was here in Australia in Wollongong. What was that like? Uh, it was it was great. I mean, it it was a bit scary. I was a lot younger then. We were um, very young in nineteen ninety three. <laughs> yeah, and um, but there was you know there were some great aunties there that kind of you know showed us around and what to do and um, I think it was one of the best conference T-shirts that ever been produced. But you oh, know, really, was, you don't have it, you know, do you? Ah, uh, no, I don't think I still have it. It's probably degraded to nothing by now. Um, <laughs> but I remember it was grey. It had, like, white handprints um, and, Ooh. you know, like, circles and stuff. But, yeah, and it was it was massive, like, you know, for, you know, someone who's just come out of uni and, and you know, the fact that you're attending a conference and there was, like, 3,000 people from um, Indigenous nations across the globe was just phenomenal. So I've tried to make it, um, you know, a regular event and I've, you know, it, it happens once every three years as you said, so, um, and I've been lucky to be working in the field of education since then. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, you know, I make it a priority as, as professional development to try and, and get there. So what, what have been some of the highlights over the years that you've, you've been going to WIPSI conferences? Um, well, it's been a few years now, so it's, you know, too many to mention, I, I suppose. But I suppose one of the significant things I've found is the opening ceremonies where all the nations come together um, and everyone's like wearing traditional dress or wearing colours that are like with 
that are associated with with different um, nations and stuff. So um, I remember in '99 in Hilo, in on the other side of the Big Island in Hawaii, um, it was one of the most culturally visually spectacular things I'd ever seen. Um, all the hotels were kind of like in a strip on the bay. Um, and we went down to the bay, so we're all standing there on the sand, so to speak. Uh, quite as not not quite as much sand as the Gold Coast, but anyway. And we were there was uh, women from different communities, I assume, um, dressed up in in their dress, and they were like dancing and singing. Um, and then on the horizon, you could see these dots, and as they come closer you realize that they were men coming in on canoes um, some people were lucky enough to get like the landscape shot of it um, Lovely. Uh, I don't think I'm, I don't think I'm gonna get such a good photo well I remember too though there was, it was um, just walking around the the town of Hilo um, and there were signs in every shop window um, welcome Lipsy Dilla uh, Delegates, mm -hmm. um, which kind of made you feel a bit special, and there was That's a when a town or a community welcomes a conference doesn't have to oh. happen very often, and it did, and like the the little signs, and they had um, if you showed your name tag, there was you know specials for for meals and all this sort of thing, yeah. and there was a I remember a photographer who'd come down to. Um, different parts of the conference and um, take photos and this was when it was film in those days um, and then his whole shop front was just photos from from the conference and different cultural events and and you yeah. could buy them for like 30 cents and stuff so um, and the I days think that's before digital. <laughs> the days Sorry? before the days before digital now you just buy a USB stick well, yeah, that's it. Um, and then I suppose another highlight would have been when we were in Calgary and um, we were hosted by, I think, the Nakoda um, Reservation. Um, mm -hmm. and it was at the foot of the Rocky Mountains. Um, you know, I remember we were all excited, checking the weather before we got there. and um, But then when we got there, it was a freaky kind of cold, bit of a cold snap. Even though outside our hotel it had a sign, have a lovely summer, because um, it was their summer holidays. Um, I think the Australians, or especially the mob we were with, had nearly every pair of bit of clothing that they'd packed with them on and still trying to move around to get warm in that we found out later on that there was a lake about a kilometre away that never unfreezes, so there was a breeze coming through um, the... You know, and it was outdoors, um, but just spectacular seeing uh, Native Americans coming down in their full gear on horseback and leading the parades of nations. And um, I'll never forget that they come out with gifts for people that were delegates from all over the world. And um, I opened a little bag and it had a handmade. Um, dream catcher made by a seven year old um, mm. out of like a twig and wool and had a little tag in it you know my name is such and such I'm seven I go to this school you know I still I actually still have that um, so it was just that whole traditional thing of gift taking our gift giving and and receiving I suppose mm. and the workshops were in teepees um, on the reservation you know um, which was uh, difficult for some in that, you know, how we're all used to PowerPoints and stuff now and um, there was, you know, um, leads running everywhere and, and stuff. But it also took us back to, I suppose, the, you know, um, the oral tradition and, and yarning and sharing stories and um, I thought it was fabulous um, to experience that. Um, a friend of mine actually went up on the hill and took a shot of the and um, of all the TVs and then the Rocky Mountains in the background. It was a spectacular view and a great great time. Well, it sounds like it was. It's it's great for the.
for cultural stuff. As an educator, though, do you get is it is it good value as an educator in terms of um, you know un learning about what other programs are doing, learning about what other programs are available, and what schools and different systems are doing? Yeah, I think so. Uh, you you know you get the personal <coughs> experience of what individuals are doing. Um, what individual schools are doing and their programs that are successful, um, looking at the process that they have to establish that, but also you get to see um, what systems are doing as well mm. um, across the country. I remember quite a few years ago when um, the Native Alaskan Network first launched their cultural standards and that was huge at the time. No one else was doing that. Um, and now, you know, across countries, we're we're all looking at cultural standards. But it also it wasn't just for the teachers; they had cultural standards for school administration, or, or I suppose what we call our systems of schools, um, and for you know communities and elders and and for young people. And it and you know that their cultural knowledge being the foundation of their identity and how Indigenous people have the right to that within their education systems, um, mm. you know, and that's just schools of systems, but they also have, you know, Indigenous people within their um, ministers of Indigenous education and things like that, but that we don't quite have access to here as yet. Yeah. Now you're presenting, so, what's your paper on? Oh, um, the paper that we're presenting is, is a is a group presentation. Um, we're doing it from the Catholic Education Commission across New South mm -hmm. Wales. Um, and what we're going to do is showcase four dioceses and our approaches to personalised learning plans for Koori kids. Um, in Sydney, we're going to focus on our team approach in that we have uh, the Archdiocese of Sydney is broken into three regions. So we have three Aboriginal education advisors in Sydney. Um, and we also have regional Aboriginal community liaison officers. Now, that's not new to departments of education, but it's new to our Catholic system, I think. Yep. So it's a joint project of working together with families and, and communities and looking at our students' learning journeys, if you will, from kindergarten right through to vocational education pathways or higher education. Um, and we're hoping to also put a bit of a spotlight on our um, performing arts program. Mm -hmm. uh, CASPER is a Sydney performing arts program and we're fortunate enough to have a Indigenous ensemble of that. Um, and so we're hoping to showcase the students' uh, video and, and them performing and being proud, proud in both their uh, culture, identity um, and faith. Sounds great. So we've written up, I wrote up the World, the WIPSI conference as a um, something that teachers might want to go to. It's okay for white fellas to go away. Eh? Yeah, yeah. Um, there's, um, I mean, it will be largely Indigenous people, but there are non-Indigenous people that attend um, yeah. as a professional development opportunity for themselves and they get to see firsthand, um, you know, expression of spirit in culturally appropriate ways. You're virtually living and, and breathing it there for your five days. But aren't you presenting a paper as well? Yes. I'm doing two. Two papers. Oh, and the first one's on... Um, two, two. So the first one's on Australian Black History Month. Um, I'm doing that one um, with Sam Cook and Juliet Hubbard. That though they're not actually not presenting, so I'm presenting on their behalf. And the other presentation is on Delhi Bloggers, which is the um, directory of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander bloggers. Um, I'm going to talk about how it got started, and um, then kind of go into a bit of a workshop about how to start blogging if you're interested in starting, if you're interested in blogging, and why you should be interested in blogging, and why you should blog more, Lisa. Uh, um, yes, Lisa. Uh, <laughs> I <laughs> okay, so yeah, no, it's, it sounds fantastic. So um, I'm really looking yeah, forward to it. The thing though with Whoopsie too is that yes, there's going to be over 500 different workshops, 
Um, but Wibsy always has the cultural excursion element, and yeah. yep. that gives an opportunity to um, to go into communities or into schools. Um, I'm hoping to go into a school where uh, culture and identity is the foundation of the young people's schooling experience, um, yep. while still incorporating and concentrating on. Um, you know your Western education system, so you know I think it'd be really interesting to see how that's done. Um, yeah. And you know, and because I know Native Hawaiians are very strong on language and stuff as well. So, mm. um, and that's with in Australia here with our new national professional standards for teachers, um, recognizing students' linguistic background and Aboriginal English is part of that standard. So how to yeah. um, Looking into that, and how language is incorporated um, yep. into the day-to-day -day running of the school. So I've written up Whipsy um, on our blog. So if you're interested in attending, because it's every three years, um, at the end of the conference next week, they'll announce where the next one is. So we actually don't know where 2017 will be um, yet. So once we find out, we'll let you know, and then you can start saving up for it. Might actually be here in Australia, who knows? So if you've just joined us, this is the critical after dinner sessions with the critical classroom. This is our very first um, hangout on air. Um, we're talking about we've just had a yarn about the World Indigenous Peoples Conference in Hawaii, um, World Indigenous Peoples Conference on Education, which is in Hawaii next week. And one, the other segment that I'd hope. I hope we can do regularly is talking about um, resources. So Lisa and I have both found a resource that we would like to share. So Lisa, you can go first. Well, oh, thanks, Fire. No oh. worries. Okay, um, this is not a new resource, but I think the it's the, the second series is quite recent. I think it was um, 2011. Um, and it's called Sharing Our Stories. And what it is is 14 big books, but they're for middle and upper primary students, which I find interesting. That's um, unusual. Normally, big books are for little people. Yes, but these have quite a bit of text um, on the pages. So, and it's what I really like about it is that it really places the stories within country. And it starts with the section about our community with information um, that places children in country and a bit about the community um, of whose cultural knowledge is contained within the story. Um, and then, and it's the community that's identified the stories that have been shared. Um, for example, the moon and the gecko is one of the stories from the Barkindji people of um, Dali. Uh, Darling River, you know, the Wilcannia mob. Um, Victoria. I have it here, but it's a big book, so it's going to be a bit difficult to... Oh, deadly. I say it uses photographs as well. Yeah, on the cover and stuff, it uses um, photographs, and it uses photographs within the actual text itself. Um, so that kids get to see, like, the, you know, there's kids playing on the riverbank sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, there's a young child in front of the school, then an elder holding up an emu egg. So even though the big book's largely got these photos all the way through, um, yeah. it also has a double page about the storyteller um, yeah. and why storytelling is important. Um, yeah. Which is good because it, you know, acknowledges whose cultural knowledge is contained within the story. But when yeah. it actually gets to the story, um, it's illustrated by young people from that community um, by their artwork. And then there's a section called Children's Voices where these young people talk about the learnings from the story um, and talk mm -hmm. about how they're proud of their culture. Um, and proud of their artwork, how doing this project, how that made them feel. Um, so, and in a way, with the ch with the children's voices, it, it's the kids almost talking directly to other kids. So, it's children teaching children, which I think makes 
it uh, adds a real element to the story, makes it um, yeah. authentic learning, if you will. It makes it relevant to the kids. Um, and then after the story, it has elders' voices, um, and they're respected community members yarning about their life experience and the importance of teaching the younger generations as they come through in Aboriginal ways of doing and knowing and um, incorporating that into school, the school curriculum. Um, and then finally it has over like the two pages, it has the story in the original language. So it's great to see our language or indigenous languages in print included mm. in the book as well. So. Fantastic. And that's a who made that one? Pearson, eh? Pearson, yeah. Pearson oh. released it and it has um, a teacher's resource with it. So it has a, a disc that has the stories um, on audio um, and then it um, divides, it's linked to our new Australian curriculum but it it's almost like a guided reading. The teachers and strategies are linked page by page to the text. Yeah. Um, and, and some teaching ideas and things like that. Fantastic. So, um, I think on the website as well, they there's some uh, like short films. So oh, okay. uh, you can then go and see kids in country or mm. um, a storyteller talking a bit in more detail about the art of storytelling um, yeah. or one of the members um, and the chance to see them all, but um, yeah. I thought that was also an interesting way to incorporate technology and and really place kids in country. Sounds good. I'll put the links up in the show notes on that one. Okay. Okay, so my turn, my show and tell turn time. There we go. Is it? Can you see that? Is it? Yeah. Okay. Sacred cows. This is an old one. Um. It's an old one, as in it's 1996, and it's by Anita Heist, and it was published by Magabala Books. Uh, I actually I have to admit, I only just read it last weekend, and I really enjoyed it. Um, it's a little bit dated because it's 96, and you know we have the internet and social networking and all that stuff now, and you know the country kind of changes. But this is a good book, and it's definitely an essential book to buy. What I like. Um, you know, Anita, and we know this from her other work and in speaking with her, that she's very sharp, she's funny, she's clever. And when I read it, I just think, I realise how observant she is. And I know that artists are like that because it's like they're, they're photographers of the world except they, they take the photograph, they take use text instead of an actual image. And Anita is fantastic at capturing... Um, aspects of Australian life that just really aren't that pretty <laughs> but she does it in a way that gives you just makes you cringe and laugh at the same time. Um, in the book she kind of unpacks a whole bunch of stuff about Australia, gambling, footy, the Melbourne Cup, royal shows, public holidays, movies, drinking, Vegemite, all that sort of stuff. I originally thought, as I started reading it, I thought it would be a good book for people who want to learn about Australia, but then I kind of realised that there are some parts of the book, there are bits in, parts in the book where I thought, you actually have to be Australian and grow up here to understand what she's talking about. There are just, there's, there's, the language is really familiar and the concepts are really familiar. I don't know if you would get the, get the context of it if you were from it somewhere else. But, and I, and I just kind of want to read and it's 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 a it's she's biting and she's clever and she depicts an Australia that is not very pretty at all. And I wanted to just it, I think the first paragraph of her introduction kind of explains the approach or the reasoning or where she's coming from. She says, "I remember how at uni I'd studied Australian history and Aboriginal history or prehistory as we were often told." My many days, nights and weekends were spent scanning library shelves looking for the book that actually had our culture right without the imperialistic or condescending view that accompanied most. I found few. This made me realise that Aboriginal culture and society in this country had been written by many 
experienced historians, anthropologists, authors and critics who were nearly always non-Indigenous and this concerned me. Now for me, she, it's like when you read this, it's like you want to talk talk about me? Well I'm going to talk about you. She she gives this like, it's like a mirror on Australianness and Australian culture and it's not a very pretty sight and I think, but I think it's really, really valuable. I think that if you're and I recommend it, even though it's like from 1996 and some of the stuff is, you know, a little bit dated. I actually think it's really good because it, um, if you're starting the journey or if you're part way through the journey of, of really turning the gaze on your own self as a non-Indigenous Australian, I think this is a good book that will get you started because, in the, you know, not so long ago we would say, well, we just need to learn about Aboriginal culture. You just need to learn about Aboriginal people and then they'll get it. Clearly that didn't work or it's not happening or whatever. But what we want, it's almost like what we want white followers to do or non-Indigenous people to do is to look at themselves and their relationship to culture and unpack some of their own assumptions about who they are. And this is the book to do that, to help you get started on that journey. So. Anita's book, Sacred Cows, Anita Heiss, Sacred Cows, and I'll put a link into it, and it, it doesn't take very long to read, and there's a few swear words in it, so it's probably, if you're going to use it with kids, senior school probably, there's a few few swear words in there, but nothing nothing that's not necessary, um, so yeah, it's funny, and she, um, she talks a lot about Australian sexism as well, the sort of hyper-masculinity of some, some aspects of Australian culture. So that's that one. So that's my book. Okay. Excellent. Have you got something yeah, for next week? Yeah. Well, we actually had the good fortune of, of um, having any, uh, Dr. Anita Heiss uh, work with some of our teachers here in Sydney mm. over the last couple of weeks. Good value, um, very good value as a speaker, as, a, as an educator. I mean, you know, as you said, hilarious, entertaining, um, thought-provoking. Um, but I remember one thing that she said that stuck with me um, is that Aborigines, oh sorry, living in Sydney, planes going over, Aborigines didn't exist until 1788. You know, um, the fact that, you know, that's someone else defining who, who we are um, yes. as Indian people of this country. And um, I'd never really thought of it that way, so. Mm. Um, no, she was great. I, it was it was excellent being able to stop in, and um, and watch her in action at in uh, Sydney last month. She's very good value. So if you run a school or a school system and you need someone to come in and run an entire day with a group of teachers, you know, thirty or something teachers, an entire day, one person, she's your person. She's fantastic. Heaps of resources. Um, keeps the audience completely engaged. It's interactive. They do work. They don't just sit there and listen, like you know, just kind of absorbing stuff. They're actually doing stuff and creating things as well. So, highly recommend well, Anita as the guest speaker. And I mean, you know, from out of a word of a participant, one of in our uh, feedback and evaluation, uh, one of our teachers said that it was the best in service they'd ever attended in oh. their life. So, well done. I think that's a huge call. So, and I know, think maybe, maybe maybe part of the the thing about Anita's ability to kind of cut through as a professional development person is that she's not like she's passionate about education. She's absolutely crazy passionate about education. Crazy passionate about Indigenous literacy. She's an Indigenous Literacy Foundation ambassador, but she actually isn't a teacher. So she can't she I don't know, she's not embedded in a system, so she's not kind of dragged down by those expectations. She just comes in with this amazing energy and can't see why things can't be done, you know, properly. You know, she doesn't have any, of, you know, which which actually makes her really effective, I think. It could make and you really effective, but she's so good, it's it's good. And open to share her experiences and stuff and show teachers how it can be done. Um, yeah. You know, by, you know, giving them the, the resources and... Um, you know, and especially around, you know, literature for, for young people, um, um, young adults in that, you know, yeah. and, and what's out there. 
Yeah. So Excellent. Not, okay. Uh, We've nearly finished. We've got one more segment, hopefully, I think. If you've just joined us, this is the critical classroom after dinner session. Um, after this dinner hangout, sorry, I'll get I'll get the I'll get it right eventually. Um, and we talk we talked about WIPSI, the World Indigenous Peoples Conference on Education. We've gone through a couple, suggested a few resources, and we'll put the links in the show notes. The last section I wanted to talk about, and we have this on our blog, is a section called "What's Your Problem." and where we answer your questions. And we've answered a few questions from um, different teachers. Um, you can submit a question anonymously. Um, some questions I don't answer because they're actually offensive. So I just think you just, yeah, some you can't answer because they're just a bit ridiculous. But we've answered a few. We've answered a couple of questions and we, we certainly um, attempt to answer anything that you, you um, that, that is an appropriate question. Um, I had one question this week, because we get questions all the time and sometimes I think um, if we can just put them all on like a life FAQ, frequently asked questions, you know, I've answered that one, go there. Um, because sometimes there are the same questions over and over again. But we had a question this, I had a question this week from a teacher looking for resources for Year 9 history and she's after resources that provide an Indigenous perspective of invasion. Um, I think that the students were examining the experiences of Australian colonisation from different perspectives and she was looking for an Aboriginal perspective of invasion. There's heaps out there so I'm not sure, yeah, what, there's a lot. I mean you can go from, and she was looking for different text types as well, different genres and I was thinking of, um, there's a, quite a few excellent um, t-shirts like uh, and protest t-shirts and poster designs like there always was, always will be. Um, T-shirts. I was thinking Women of the Sun, but episode one, I'll enter the flame, but Lisa's thinking maybe year nine might be a bit young for that one, please. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was just, yeah, so I mean, I, I've showed it before in the classroom, but generally um, not, not be say, yeah, yeah, I'd still say year 11 and 12, maybe uh, year 10. Um, oh, yeah. You should have a look at it. If you haven't, have if you haven't seen it, you, it, you need to do more than it is. Like, because, and, and I think it's great that the whole film is in language, but it means that there's subtitles and stuff and some other content in it. I'm not Pretty sure. Cool, Even though it's not specific, it's, yeah, there's still some other content. I, I probably would still target that at, at your senior stage six. It's student. funny, isn't it? Because it's not so much the nudity, but the violence of it. And yet, a lot yeah. of a yeah, lot I wasn't thinking. Thirteen or fourteen-year-olds, there'd be more violence in a um, Avengers movie. But this, but you know that that violence is fake. Whereas the stuff that happens in Women of the Sun is real, and it's kind. It yeah, it's different. So have a look at it. But that is certainly a good video. If you haven't seen the Women of the Sun series, I they are essential. Um, the other uh, resource that I would suggest are the NAIDOC posters um, and you can act like from previous years NAIDOC posters some of the early year stuff and you can get that you can access the NAIDOC posters from the IATSIS collection online they have most of the videos um, most of the videos most of the the posters online there's a few years that are missing but but most of them are there um, and I'll put that link in the show notes and the other one is, and this is one that Anita reminded us of in her presentation, is the Last Connection song. Last Connection are a hip, Australian hip hop band, an Australia, uh, Indigenous hip hop band, and their song called "I Still Call Australia Home" is a good one. And I'll put there's a couple of versions of that on YouTube that you can access. There's a con I, I've seen the concert one, but it's actually really hard to understand the um, the the words in her in that that they that there's the, the of the lyrics, but the other there's one there that's been created by somebody else and it has images that really bring home and uh, make it really clear what the song is about. So I would recommend that one as well. Um, I'm sure there is a Kevin Gilbert or a uh, Audrey New Knuckle poem that would also fit there. We can have a look around for that and see, and perhaps write a blog post on that one. So if you have any questions, please. Let us know what they are. You can either tweet them, Facebook them, Google Plus them, or fill in the form on the website. I think that's about it. 
We're nearly done. Cool. First one down. <laughs> First one down. It's a wrap. No, nah, not a wrap just yet. I was just going to say thank you for joining us on our first Critical Classroom Google Hangout. Next week uh, we will be in Hawaii. So if we have an internet connection, we will. Um, it would be great if we could um, hang out on air from Hawaii. But we may not be. Able, we may not make it because of the. Um, it's all about web connections. Um, don't forget you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Google Plus and at our blog. We don't have a YouTube, um, Critical Classroom YouTube account but you can follow me, Lisa Wadigo, on YouTube for all the Critical, critical Classroom videos. Um, and don't forget I've created a few playlists there that might be of interest to you, interest to um, teachers and, and others. Um, hopefully we'll bring you interviews and more and more resources. If you have resources that you want us to share, send us a copy and we, we should be able to um, and we can review them and have a yarn about them. Um, that's it. We've done. That's more than half an hour though, Lisa. You talk too much. Oh. You um, talk too much. That wasn't as scary as I thought it would. <laughs> You did it. Thanks very much for listening. We had a few viewers. We are awesome. Thank you. See you later. Bye. Bye.